appreciate those kind words. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak on this subject. You know, the Bible teaches we need to rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those that weep. And it saddens me that we're missing a few brethren, you know, in particular, Doug McClish and David Brown, and we understand their health problems. And we certainly, uh, you know, just, it's, it's sad that they're not here. But they're familiar faces, uh, stalwarts of the faith, defenders of the truth, and, and uh, we miss them when they're not here. And on the other side of that, I want to rejoice with uh, Gene Hill. Uh, yesterday he lost his name tag and he couldn't find himself <laughs> he, but he found his tag and and he once was lost but now he's found uh, I always thought that it really wasn't anything to do with his name tag but his name you know Gene Hill he's so far over the hill he can't even remember seeing the hump so <laughs> That might have been his problem, I don't know, but anyway. You know, there seems to be a keen interest uh, in spiritual gifts, this topic. Uh, and with that interest, there's a lot of confusion and, and misunderstanding and outright error that's being taught uh, on spiritual gifts. And this confusion is primarily a result of ignorance of the scriptures. You know, we, we've had lessons, and I'll tell you what. Just, I'm going to chase a rabbit, I'm going to tell you I'm going to chase a rabbit, I'm going to chase him out about to right here, and then we're going to come back. This congregation and these lectureships, uh, if you compare the topics of these lectureships over the years with most other lectureships, and probably the exception would be the spring congregation and the old Denton lectureships, uh, these lectures deal with issues that are pertinent to the church right now Amen. and uh, that's that's the thing and we're we're trying the, the the desire is to call people back to the bible and get them back to study in the bible ignorance of the scripture you know again this is a common topic in many of the lectureships over the last few years my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge uh, we are living where there's a famine of God's word in the land. And that famine isn't caused on God's part. He's readily made his word available. And if we're ignorant on a topic, it's nobody's fault but our own. Okay, we need, we have the information available for us. We have minds that God has given us with the capability of reasoning and understanding the word that he's given. And so when we talk about we're destroyed for lack of knowledge, that's on us. Or if there's a famine of God's word in the land, that's on us. And we can't make an excuse. My time isn't over already, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, man, okay. In conclusion, <laughs> not even out of my first or second sentence yet. Uh, but it's on us. It's incumbent upon us to study God's word. And to learn and know these things. And then as we develop an understanding of God's word, we need to reach out and try to help other people. And uh, so the, the idea that there's confusion and error to all this is because people are ignorant of God's word. Furthermore, many people trust in their feelings rather than faith that comes through a study of God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15, Romans 10.17. A lot of people wouldn't trade how they feel in their heart for all of the scriptures in the Bible. And I've, I've been told that. I'm sure many of you preachers out there heard that as well. So we're going we're gonna to talk about this from a biblical standpoint. We need to recognize that everything that we can know about spiritual gifts is revealed for us in the Bible. However, words do have meaning. I mean, however, when we think about this, any belief that contradicts what the Bible teaches is wrong and therefore sinful. Okay, we need to recognize that. And so in this lesson, we're going to consider some of the false views of spiritual gifts. Then we're going to discuss the purpose of spiritual gifts. And we're going to move on uh, to our third point and discuss the duration of spiritual gifts. 
And there are various false views regarding uh, spiritual gifts. Some views may seem to be harmless, uh, misuse of maybe the term spiritual gifts. However, words do have meaning, and we must strive to call Bible things by Bible names. Okay, if we're going to talk about spiritual gifts, then we need to be talking about the same thing that the Bible calls spiritual gifts. And other views seek to extend the duration of spiritual gifts beyond the biblical limits. And so those are a couple of things that, that are at issue here. The purpose, the nature, and the duration. Well, there's wrong views held regarding the purpose of spiritual gifts. As to the nature of these gifts, some believe that these spiritual gifts are really just various talents that individuals possess that are to be used in the work and worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in our service to God. On the Waterbury Church of Christ website, one can find a survey that is used to take a spiritual gifts inventory. Now, I want to quote from that website. It says this, and I quote, This is not a test, so there are no wrong answers. The spiritual gifts inventory consists of 80 statement items. Some items reflect concrete actions. Other items are descriptive traits, and still others are statements of belief. And I give the reference to that uh, web address, that ULR, in the manuscript. As this, survey, uh, this survey is filled out and is to be returned to the elders. There's another example. The West Waynesboro Church of Christ website has this quote. He said, a spiritual gift, they're going to define it for us as co according to what they believe it is. A spiritual gift is a gift or ability that God entrusts to each of his people in order to involve them in the task of advancing his purpose Together, it is very possible and highly likely that each follower of Christ possesses more than one gift, although one gift will probably be, will score higher than all the rest. If you would like to know how God has wired or gifted you in order to better serve him and his church, you can click on the text below for a PDF version of a spiritual gift assessment test and we give the reference for the ULR there. Now, it's obvious from these two statements, and by the way, all I did was Google spiritual gifts and there's dozens of congregations out there, maybe, maybe more than dozens. I may be, be generous on the small number. I think it's larger than that because I didn't follow all the links. I just clicked on the top two and that's what I got. But there are other congregations out there that claim to be the Lord's church that have similar surveys and similar statements. And so this is a common belief among members of the Lord's church. That, that a spiritual gift is simply an ability or a talent that God has given us for us to use. And they have various ways for you to determine what that talent is. But the problem with this is the term spiritual gifts is never used that way in the Bible. It's, you just can't find it. To introduce, uh, I introduce this discussion of the purpose of the duration of miracles, Paul stated, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1. Even though the Bible plainly says, the Apostle Paul being inspired by the Holy Spirit, this is God's will, he doesn't want us to be ignorant about spiritual gifts, it's obvious from just very little research that there's ignorance, not just in the denominational world, but ignorance in the Lord's church over the meaning of spiritual gifts. Now we need to, again, if we're going to talk about things, we need to call Bible things by Bible names. So if we're going to talk about spiritual gifts, we need to get back by, to what the Bible refers to as spiritual gifts. Now, when we think about spiritual gifts, we have the idea, the, 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 or really the 
false view as to their purpose and dur duration. Even when we get it right and we, we talk about spiritual gifts in the true biblical sense as being miraculous, then we have a, a problem with some who would misunderstand, well, what was the purpose of those miraculous spiritual gifts? And how long were they to last? Most, if not all, denominations, including Roman Catholicism, believe and teach spiritual gifts are still available today. In particular, the Pentecostal Church and the Assembly of God, along with various others, believe miraculous gifts are to last throughout the entire Christian age. I'm going to chase another rabbit for just a second. It's talking about elders and how that they should be examples, lead the flock. John, Johnny, you did a good job on that. I'm going to say that publicly. Uh, Johnny did a good job. I appreciate him and his work and what he does, how he says, how he preaches. I, I really like how he's right down the line. Easy, easy to understand. And, and the fact that elders need to be an example it made me think about uh, Jim Williams, elder I had when I was in uh, the East End congregation, Little Rock, Arkansas. He was away that week, and he came back that Sunday morning. He was, one, he was not only an elder, but he was a song leader. And he gets up to lead singing, and he starts talking about how much uh, he really appreciates a cappella singing. Now, Terry Hightower says that, and, and rightly so, that the aesthetics of a cappella singing isn't the standard. But he was saying, oh, how wonderful it was that we sing without the instruments, because the last weekend... He had attended at a Pentecostal congregation and they had instrumental music and he just said, man, it was horrible. And he, said, and he explained that the reason that he went there was because it was a friend of his that had started that congregation and to encourage people to come, they were giving out free tickets to Branson and he was after the tickets. <laughs> Boy, the brethren were after me. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> so um, he was pretty good-hearted. I went and, and, and talked to him about it, and he got up that night and repented. Uh, but I'm telling you, that's the, the, the lunacy that's out there. Here's a, a congregation, I mean a, a denomination, that is whole hog off on the nature and purpose of spiritual gifts, the duration of spiritual gifts, and he didn't have a problem going there and worshiping with that. I, there's something broken there. Okay? There's something broken in that man's idea of reasoning and, and things that he couldn't see up front that that was wrong. And that tells you whether or not uh, he was qualified to be an elder in the first place. Needless to say, after I preached a series of sermons on the qualifications and work of the eldership, when I preached the last sermon, one of the elders' wives says, finally it's over. And a few weeks later, I was over. <laughs> Somebody said they uh, preached a moving sermon. I, don't, I think it was... Uh, Jerry Brewer preached a moving sermon. Well, I preached a moving sermon. I moved after the sermon. So, you know, that's the thing. But when we talk about this, people are just ignorant a lot of times. They don't think. They don't reason. They just go out and do stuff and ex as assume it's right. We need to get back to the Bible and make sure that when we're talking about spiritual gifts we're talking about the right thing and we figure out what the bible says the right purpose is and then if there's a length of duration we need to get that right as well these are things that are essential to our salvation and we can't afford to be wrong on these things just can't be afford to be wrong. Not only are we going to jeopardize our soul, but if we get up and preach error on it and other people follow that teaching, what's going to happen to their soul? Yes, they're lost. That's exactly right. So, so brother, we can't afford to just guess at this stuff. 
or we can't afford to assume anything. We need to make sure what we're saying is according to the scripture. You know, a while ago I said a lot of people talk, think that uh, are, are in error on the spiritual gifts because they're ignorant. I think some people are dishonest. I think that's the way too. And I say that not just flippantly. There was a preacher friend of mine, Roger Barron, the guy that converted me, said he was in the shoe store one time. He was going to pick up some shoes he had resold. And he saw a pair of, of, of dress shoes up on the shelf, and they had metal plates in the, in the soles of those shoes. And he asked the guy that, that was working on the shoes, he said, um, what are those plates for? And he says, oh, those belong to the Pentecostal preacher here in town. He has electrodes in the stage, and he'll go stand over on those electrodes, and when people comes up and he puts hands on them, he shocks them. <laughs> it gives them a shock, and they think that's the Holy Spirit. That guy's not just ignorant, he's a liar. He's a crook, somebody says. That's exactly right. I remember when I was in the Philippines, Joe Spangler and I was over there and we was uh, teaching in some Bible schools and preaching some gospel meetings and they had a big tent meeting going on and uh, there was a faith healer there, big popular faith healer in the Philippines is in Manila. And we was getting the cab and Joe and I was talking about, Joe had a withered arm, he had polio when he was a boy and he had a withered arm. And uh, I said, Joe, let's go over there and ask them to heal your arm. And Joe was ready to go. We said, okay, go. And so we told the cab driver to take us over there to that tent. And he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He says, if you go over there and you do that, they're going to arrest you. So he, ref see, he knew it was a lie. He knew they couldn't heal real ailments the way Jesus and the apostles did. See, they, they can't do that. It's a lie. And many of them aren't just mistaken. They're liars and they're con men. Now, is that my judgment? Some, maybe on some point, but there's evidence behind that. There's evidence that shows that at least some of them are charlatans. And so, so we see this. They, they believe that spiritual gifts are to last throughout the entire Christian age. Furthermore, it's commonly held belief among most other denominations that these gifts continue today in a limited way. They are convinced that the Holy Spirit continues to illuminate and lead and strengthen the individual believer. And it is believed that the Holy Spirit does this separate and apart from the, and in addition to the Word of God. Now, does that sound familiar? It's unfortunate that this same false idea of a limited, a limited application of spiritual gifts continues in the church today. Mac Deaver holds this position. And he's got a whole bunch of followers. It's amazing, friends and brethren, that that, that doctrine has got so much support among Christians. It is amazing to me how people, I think people held that view, but they were, they were afraid to say anything for a long time. But when they had a champion to rally around, they were right out of the closet. And by the way, I believe there's a bunch of closet liberals among us. And I think 2005 showed who some of them were. Closet liberals. People that say and do the right thing until it becomes inconvenient and then they come out of the closet for a dollar, maybe even 50 cents after taxes. But that's the way some people are. They say the right thing. They do the right things because they're trying to support nine good works, right? Right? And then when, when, when the truth comes out and they're called upon to make a stand, right? Doesn't matter whether it's on spiritual gifts, our topic right now, or other issues. It doesn't matter. When the truth becomes inconvenient, then their true colors begin to show. 
And I think that's what's happened with this direct operation of the Holy Spirit deal that, that began with Mac Deaver. It maybe didn't begin with him, but was popularized among one sound brethren, and then they start lining up behind Mac. He's got a lot to answer for, doesn't he? And even though he might have been the nucleus that got it started, each and every one of them that followed him and supported that doctrine, they have a lot to answer for. We can't just blame it all on Mac. Because there's a lot of people that came out of the woodwork and, and just or came out of the closet and just did what? They said, oh yeah, I believed that for years. Really? How come you didn't say anything? Mac himself claims to have believed it for years. Oh, really? When you taught me back in 1987 and 88 and 89 in Southwest School of Bible Study, you didn't teach it to me then. In fact, you taught me just the opposite. Roy Deaver taught me the opposite on spiritual gifts. He always said that he would make the illustration the woodsman goes out to chop down a tree and he uses the axe. Now who chopped down the tree? Did the woodsman or the axe? Well, the woodsman did it, but he used the instrument of the axe. And then he would apply that to the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit affects the human heart. How does he do it? Through the Word. That's his instrument. I remember Brother Roy Deaver making the illustration. He would hold his hands up. Here's the human heart. Here's the Holy Spirit. Now some people teach it spirit on spirit. Just like that. He said, that's not right. Here's, here's the way it works. Here's, your, here's the human spirit. Here's the Word. And here's the Holy Spirit. I refuse to believe that Roy taught that. I just never saw it in him. I studied under him for two years. Studied under Mac for two years. Learned a lot from both of them. And I just don't believe that they held that position back then. And if they did, then they were dishonest. And that pains me to say. More than you know. But that's where we are with this spiritual gift. Some people are honestly mistaken. Some people are, are, are dishonestly mistaken. If I can say it in the nice way. So we think about this error on the purpose. See, it's, it's, it's in the church. It's in the church. Maybe not fully Pentecostal, in it, but there may be some of that too. But at least this limited view of the work of the Holy Spirit and the use of spiritual gifts. What about the true purpose? Spiritual gifts were an important part of the early church. Today, if anyone wants to know God's will, all they have to do is pick up a Bible and open it up and read for themselves. Though many choose not to. You know, it's sad when we can't get people to study the Bible. Whether on their own or in a group or a personal Bible study, what we used to call cottage meetings. You know, Paul taught them publicly in house to house. It's harder to get them to come and hear it publicly. And it's even harder to get them to let us come to their house. And that's sad. And we wonder why our country's in the shape it's in. Part of the reason that it's getting harder and harder for people to, to agree to a Bible study is the fact that they don't think they need to because they're waiting on the Holy Spirit to do something for them. And you know, that's going to be a long wait. It's going to be a long wait. It's just not going to happen. So if we want to know God's will, we pick up a Bible during the infancy of the church. Christians were not afforded this luxury. And the reason is the Bible was not yet completed. Spiritual gifts were used in the first century by God to reveal His will to man. And following its brief duration of, uh, of the, the purpose of these miracles, once that purpose was fulfilled, they ceased. Spiritual gifts were used for revelation, for proclamation, and confirmation of God's Word. 
There are nine spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, which are wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. You know, Jeremiah stated in chapter 10 and verse 23 of his prophetic book, it says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Thus man needs direction from God on how to live in this life. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3 that we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness through a knowledge of, of Jesus Christ. Now, when we think about all things that pertain to life and godliness, life is our general day-to-day -day living. Godliness is our piety before God. So we have all of our life covered. Whether we're talking about our day-to-day -day living or whether we're talking about our worship to God or service to God, it's all covered in the Scriptures. It's through knowledge, not through the Holy Spirit, other, other than the fact that the Holy Spirit is the one that brought us the revelation and then confirmed the revelation and the proclamation of that word. See, that was the Holy Spirit's part. That's what He did. So it's necessary. This requires revelation. Furthermore, man needed to proclaim the right message in the correct language Thus, it was necessary to have the gift of prophecy, discern the spirits, interpretation of tongues. We needed to have those things in the first century. Since the early church did not have the complete New Testament, it was necessary to confirm the message that was being taught. You know, today, if we want to confirm our message, how do we do it? Book, chapter, and verse, right? You know, it's getting harder and harder to find people that preach book, chapter, and verse anymore. Some we do. We do because we know the value of it. I don't want anybody to go home and say, well, the preacher said. Now, people that don't use book, chapter, and verse, that's all people can say. But if I give book, chapter, and verse, and you write it down the way you should, and you go home and you're like those Bereans, and search the scriptures daily, you can know whether I said the truth or not. Now back then, they couldn't just pick up the Bible and do that. So when they preached, they would perform a miracle, and that was evidence that what they said was true. Now see, the remember, the revelation, the proclamation, and confirmation of the word. They had to reveal God's will, right? They would go out and speak it or they would write it. But it was always confirmed. It was always confirmed. The revelation they received and were proclaiming had to be proven that it was indeed the word of God. Therefore, God gave them the gifts of faith, healing, miracles, uh, of faith, healing, and miracles, and tongues. Acts 3 and verse 11, 13 verse 11, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22, Acts 2, 1 through 5. By the way, somebody mentioned earlier this lectureship that speaking in tongues was supposed to be an indication that you were accepted of God. And they said, well, you know, and then they, they asked the question, well, does everybody in your congregation speak in tongues? And they said, no. See, how, that's how inconsistent people get. But think about, the, what's the true use of tongues in the first century? In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22, tongues were a sign to unbelievers. Wasn't assigned to believers, it was assigned to unbelievers. On Acts chapter 2, when they spoke in tongues, who were the unbelievers? The Jews. Right? This is that which was spoken by Joel. Right? This is, this is the fulfillment of that. In Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius and his household, the Spirit fell upon them and they spoke in tongues, who were the unbelievers there? Same people, the Jews. 
In Acts chapter 2, it was pr to prove to the unbelieving Jews that that was God's message. In Acts chapter 10, again, it was uh, to the unbelieving Jews, Christian Jews this time, Christians, Jews had be become Christians, but they were still holding on to the old law and trying to make a distinction between Jew and Gentile. This was to prove to them that the Gentiles could be saved the same way as the Jews. No distinction. You see, when we look at the Bible and we make application of the Scripture, now all these things start to make sense. So why would anybody try to say that tongues are a sign to believers? Was it used that way in the first century? So when we think about this in fulfilling the Great Commission, the apostles went forth and they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, now get this, and confirming the word with signs following Mark 16 and verse 20. Later, the Hebrews writer asked, how shall we escape, escape, escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first was began to be spoken of the Lord, and was confirmed unto us that heard him. Notice, it was, the message was confirmed. How was it confirmed? With miracles, signs, and wonders. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15. The apostle Paul says that the message, the new covenant, was confirmed. How was it confirmed? With miracles, signs, and wonders. So we conclude that spiritual gifts spoken of in the New Testament were used for the special purpose, the specific purpose of revelation, proclamation, and confirmation of God's message. Any attempt to assign a different purpose to these gifts results in corrupting of God's word, which is sin. Galatians 1, 6 through 10, Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. Consequences. There are consequences, brethren, when we add to take away from or pervert or corrupt God's word. There are consequences to that. Consequences personally and consequences to those that we teach. Consequences. So the duration. The duration of spiritual gifts. And by the way, <laughs> Michael limits us to four to six pages on these manuscripts. Okay. Johnny, I, could, I couldn't believe how much he got out of his four pages. <laughs> right but uh, I'm telling you the, there's much we could say to help better clarify these points I mean much more but we're again and I understand I'm not criticizing the four to six pages it is what it is and we do it for cons conservation of space resource and I understand all that but I, I'm telling you brethren this is just a small portion of the study of this and any topic that we're covering there's much more study that you need to do personally on these issues to get it firmly fixed not only in your mind so that if somebody comes along and tries to teach something else you'll be able to answer them remember we need to be able to give an answer to anyone that asks us so let's look at the duration as we previously noted, the Bible teaches that miraculous gifts were needed for a specific purpose. However, these gifts were only temporary. God never intended for the spiritual gifts, those that we're talking about, He never intended for them to be a part, permanent part of Christianity. Just never was. They were to confirm the word until the revelation was completed in written form. This right here. When we had all of this, then it was over. The need was fulfilled. Okay? Now, once the written revelation was complete, spiritual gifts would come to an end. Now, regarding this, the Apostle Paul wrote this. Remember in, in 1 Corinthians 13, the first few verses, he talks about love, right? He introduces chapter 13 with the last verse of chapter 12 where he, he begins his discussion of spiritual gifts and their abuse. See, they were being abused in the first century. That's what 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 is all about. 
They were abusing those gifts. So he's writing this to straighten that out. So he introduces the spiritual gifts and he concludes that, that we're all baptized in one body and, and those gifts were to be used for the edification of the whole body. They weren't for the glorification of any one individual. But they were to be used to edify the entire congregation. And then he says at the last verse, and yet I show you a more perfect way. Well, that more perfect way, it begins in, in verse 1 of chapter 13, where he talks about love. Love is a, a more perfect way to edify the brethren than spiritual gifts. And yet we have countless thousands who want to turn their back on the more perfect way and go back to a less perfect way. Love never fails, but whether they be prophecies, they shall be done away. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall be done, uh, it shall be done away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I felt, uh, I felt as a child, I thought as a child. Now that I am a man, I have put away childish things. And notice that. Not only do they want to go back to a less perfect way, but they want to go from maturity back to immaturity. Spiritual gifts were for the immature church. But when the church reached its maturity and had the full revelation, that which was in part would be done away. Put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even also, uh, even as also I was fully known. He said, it's like looking in a dark mirror. You can't really see everything, but you can see some things. Right? But when that dark mirror is taken out of the way, you can see face to face. And you can know what your features really are. While the revelation was coming, they knew a little bit at a time, but when it was fully revealed, it would be like seeing their self face to face in the mirror. They could see the whole picture. When that time came, then the spiritual gifts would be over. And he goes on, But now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, the greatest of these is love. Love never fails. Whether they be prophecies, see that's one of those spiritual gifts, they shall be done away. Never intended to be perfect. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Never intended to be perfect. Whether there be knowledge, it shall be done away. But when that which is perfect, we know in part, we prophesy in part. And notice, he's talking about that revelation process. Now, at this time, we know in part, we prophesy, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. That's not talking about Jesus. You have to be a full preterist to believe that. That's not talking about Jesus. The word perfect there means complete, finished. When the complete revelation is here, that which is in part shall be done away. And I'm going to skip a bunch because Mike was over here. He's getting nervous because I'm bigger than him. And he's wondering how he's going to stop me. <laughs> the process. You know, we had in the first century in the book of Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles. That's how they received miraculous gifts those spiritual gifts. Other than that, we see from a study of Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 17, when the Samaritans believed, apostles had to come all the way from Jerusalem down to Samaria to lay hands on them so that they could receive a miraculous gift. We see the same thing in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And by the way, Apollos was the only person considered eloquent in the Bible and he started out as a false teacher. What were they saying about boring preachers earlier? <laughs> I don't know. But, but what happened? After Paul taught them the truth and they obeyed the Great Commission gospel. See, they'd only been baptized under John's gospel. But when they obeyed the gospel of Christ 
and their sins had been washed away in the blood of Christ, then he laid hands on them. Right? And they prophesied. See, they received miraculous gifts through the laying on the apostles' hand. That's the only other way it comes. Holy Spirit baptism, I don't care what Mac and other people say, is limited to the apostles. The only other way to get it is the laying on the apostles' hands. And since the last apostle died about 1900 years ago or more, what happened to the ability to import spiritual gifts? <coughs> Do you remember just when the last apostle died? <laughs> we don't have the ability to even receive the spiritual gifts today because we have no living apostles. Nor do we have the need for spiritual gifts today. Am I done? You're done. I'm done. Say amen, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, that, that was a very shocking lesson. <laughs> Where'd you get your shoes, was it? <laughs> now, I, I think he proved to us that he has that spiritual gift of preaching. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the there, as with all these lessons, there's so much more that could be stated. Um, I know that uh, I was assigned uh, the subject of miraculous healing today, and the director of that lectureship allowed all of the forty plus pages that I sent him in the book. And that was just in one small aspect of what you're dealing with in this. But we have so many brethren who have no concept of these very basic points anymore. And it's not surprising. There's a Facebook group that got into a discussion of this subject. And I posted my material on dealing with 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. That was basically ignored. Took, I think, three posts to get it in there. And last I think, it was still going on with over a couple of hundred comments being made. One of them by a teacher in a supposedly Christian college. And he was arguing that he doesn't really know. He's not sure that this, whether this could be the completed revelation of God's word or Christ or heaven or what it what might be. And that man's teaching others. He doesn't know if he's saved then. <laughs> he doesn't know much of anything. <laughs> well, yeah, somebody said all of them, but uh, not all of them, but uh, I think he's an instructor at Pepperdine. So that's why I said a supposed Christian college. But um, it's sad. You hear all of the time these individuals talking about this spiritual gift that I have or that one that I have. Uh, we need to get back to Bible teaching on this subject. And... Bruce, that was an excellent lesson in dealing with this. Uh, if you deal with that purpose of miracles, that really takes care of the whole situation. Uh, either what revelation are you going to give me 
Okay, that's one of the purposes of it. And then confirming it. Uh, well, they generally don't have a message. Uh, talking to another one that was arguing the same thing. They were a prophet. So I asked them what prophecy they were going to give us that was not found in the Bible. I did put a hint there of Galatians 1, 8, and 9, though. And so they, what they did, they wrote out a few verses of the Bible, and that was to prove that they were a prophet. <laughs> that doesn't prove anything. What's the prophecy that you're going to give that's not found in the Bible? And I was rude and crude and mean to them, so they refused to answer. Well, we need to, because this is becoming more and more prevalent all the time, we need to deal with this subject, and we appreciate Brother Bruce doing that.